I'm Michael Ma from the American Friends of the National Gallery of Australia. Welcome to another episode of Art Talks from New York. Back in the 1960s, the great African-American soul performer Sam Cooke sang, it's been a long time coming about civil rights in the United States. It's a line which could just as easily apply to women in the visual arts. Recognition of their contribution has indeed been a long time coming, but now finally, museums and galleries are beginning to take notice and give women artists their rightful place in the world's great collections. Here in New York, the Museum of Modern Art has led the way undertaking a year long rehang in which the canon of dead white male artists has had to move over just a little to make room center stage for masterpieces by women. And at the National Gallery of Australia, a major initiative pushing in this same direction is also underway. The gallery has just launched an exhibition and campaign called Know My Name to celebrate Australian women artists. To discuss this defining moment and the exciting global movement to give women artists the recognition they're long overdue, the American Friends has gathered together a remarkable panel for you. Dr. Deborah Hart is the head curator of Australian art at the NGA and has co-curated the Know My Name exhibition. As well, she's an active participant in the broader campaign at the gallery to achieve gender equity in displays and acquire more art by women for Australia's national collection. Dr. Anne Temkin is the chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York and oversaw the groundbreaking year-long reimagining of MoMA's collection, which dramatically increased the presence of women artists in a bold, indeed exhilarating celebration of diversity. Dr. Anne Summers is a best-selling author, journalist, and leading feminist with a distinguished career in politics, the media, business, and the non-government sector in Australia, Europe, and the United States. Dr. Summers' book, The Lost Mother, deals with a once celebrated woman artist who was subsequently lost to history. And to moderate our discussion, we're very fortunate to have with us Time Magazine's award-winning editor-at-large, Belinda Luscombe. Belinda is an Australian-American who's lived in New York for many years and has written extensively on the arts and women's issues. So without further ado, it's over to my friend and colleague, Belinda Luscombe, and our wonderful panelists. Thanks, Michael. So I wanna start this discussion as journalists often do with a bit of a story. Um, as a young Sydney University graduate, I traveled uh, the, to Europe as Australians do. And I came across for the first time a portrait of the artist Jean Miro. And I was devastated, frankly, because I had always assumed that it was Joan Miro and that he was a she, and she was one of the great historical artists that I could always talk about when people said that women couldn't be artists. So having sort of processed this disappointment, I decided to look through the museums of Europe for other artists that I could point to as great examples of female painters or sculptors. And of course, this will surprise nobody on this panel, I was unable to find very many. So. You know, I'm sort of a young 20 something and I begin to think, wait a minute, can can women not be artists? Can women not paint? Like, is this not something we do? And um, I realized that although I had a Bachelor of Arts from Sydney, I did not know the name of very many female artists. I could not name any. So I am extremely excited today to be able to talk to you, Deborah about uh, the, the Know My Name exhibition and so that young Australians will not be deprived in the way I was. Can you tell me a little bit about how the exhibition came together and what impact you're hoping it will have? Yes, thank you so much. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to do before I begin is to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on this beautiful land that I'm sitting on in Canberra and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So in answer to your question, you know, when we first pitched this exhibition to our director, Nick Mitsevich, we had a big image of portraits of women. So very interesting relating to what you were saying. And in fact, it was portraits from 1900 to now. And 
he looked at the image and it was like a light bulb moment. And he said, I wonder how many people out there would know those women's names, would recognize their art. So that was really something that was an opening up. And as we went through the pitch, we talked about the pivotal role that women have played in relation to environment. You know, women were among the first environmentalists. There were indigenous women who obviously have this profound connection with country. There was um, a slide that showed the, the pioneering work of women artists in terms of the modern art movement and abstraction. We looked at images where women, um, and this relates very much to the work that Anne Summers um, was doing in this country, um, to do with collectives, to do with women coming together, grouping together, to raise consciousness about women's art in the 1970s. And that was a really pivotal moment as well. And looking at relationships to the body, so that confidence that some women artists have in representing their own bodies and, and taking control. And I guess throughout this, this exhibition and the initial pitch that we made, it was about a non-linear narrative, looking at connections and lineages across time. So they were the kind of things that were shaping our thinking of this um, exhibition, which includes some 300 works by women artists. Amazing. Um, so Anne Temkin, we have two Annes, so I'm going to guess I'll call you Anne T. Uh, so you helped organize uh, an enormous rehang, as, as Michael said, of probably one of the most iconic museums in the world. Um, and, uh, it, you know, institutions like MoMA are, are partly a record of history of what was influential at the time. And so I'm wondering, can we, can we go back in time and make an artist influential when she wasn't? Like, can, can, you, can you rewrite history in that way? Um, you know, people are never gonna stop lining up to see, say, the water lilies or, or you know, uh, an Andy Warhol. Can you recreate that kind of importance for artists that have been underrepresented by these these institutions in the past. And I wondered how you uh, address that in your rehang. Yeah, well, I love um, your example. It makes the answer easy for me. What people almost um, completely do not know today is that Monet's water lilies in their own time were absolutely reviled. And it took about 50, no, from, when he died in 1926, about 30 years later to the mid 1950s, for those works to start to look interesting and to become collected, and then almost instantaneously to become the beloved treasures that they still are today. But I use that as an example, and there are so, so many more of the idea that what becomes an icon is constantly being refreshed and renewed and revised. So yes, I've seen even in the last decade, things that we've put on the wall by women artists who would have been dismissed as unimportant 20 years ago or less, become now as solid um, icons or, or landmarks on our gallery walls as Andy Warhol. Is that something in your rehang that you sought to do? Was that part of your thinking? Or, you know, I know it was very extensive and uh, cross-disciplinary, but was uh, the sort of importance of women one of the, the principles that was guiding it? Yes, it was. It was. We obviously couldn't do everything all at once um, to expand the representation um, in all the ways it needed to be expanded from an essentially very white male perspective of many decades there to before. But we made certain priorities. And um, for me, the women one was a simple one. We're 50% of the population, We're not a special interest group or a certain geography or um, a certain ethnicity. We're half the population um, and more than half of the population of our attendance, of our audience. So that just was an absolute um, given for all of us. And Summers, so uh, your book, uh, The Lost Mother, it, it examines the story of a once celebrated artist who painted your mother 
and was subsequently lost to history. And I wonder if you could take us a little bit through that story, what happened to her? Uh, and if you could tell me us a little bit, is her story unique? Is it like a one woman thing or is it part of a pattern that we see? Well, it's a very good question, uh, Belinda, and it certainly uh, goes to some of the points that Anne T was, was just making um, in, in respect of, uh, you know, who lives, who dies, who tells my story uh, when it comes to women in the art world. Constance Stokes, uh, the name of, of the artist, she, uh, her story is, is unique in that she was a very, very um, unique uh, artist. It's one of the reasons perhaps she wasn't cherished as much as she should have been because her, her um, she didn't conform to some of the norms of the time. But I think the more, the bigger, the bigger issue with her is that she, she was discovered initially in the 1930s. She was a very celebrated, her first one woman show, she, she did extremely well and her everything was sold and she was picked up by collectors. She then uh, was rediscovered in the 40s, again in the 50s, again in the 1964, um, then again in 1986, uh, then after she died in 1993, and then again by me in 2009. So she's some, the question I would ask about um, her, but I think this has happened with a lot of artists, both male and female, but particularly with some women, is what does it take uh, for you to, to be discovered and for it to stick? I mean, what, what, how, how is it that you're admitted into the canon? Just somebody like Constance Stokes, who was extraordinarily critically successful. I mean, she, uh, was one of 12 Australian artists, uh, the first showing of Australian artists uh, in New York City in 1941. Uh, there was an exhibition of 12 paintings at the Met and she was one of them. Um, she was later one of the, the 12 artists exhibited in London uh, in a, an exhibition put on by the British Council to celebrate the Queen's coronation and she was singled out uh, as the leading artist in that exhibition. Uh, she had patrons, she, you know, she, she had uh, two critical success, she sold everything, she made a lot of money, and yet she kept on being lost to history. And so and I'm so pleased that, uh, Deborah, that you have uh, rediscovered her yet again. And what I find particularly um, poignant in a way is that the painting of Constance Stokes that is being shown in Know, know Her Name is the very same painting that was exhibited at the Met in 1941. Wow, that's that's full circle, that story. Um, so, Deborah, uh, the National Gallery has acknowledged that women artists make up only about a quarter of its collection. And as part of this Know My Name um, campaign, the gallery's undertaken to implement some new principles, some new guiding principles to try and uh, ensure gender parity in future programming. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what those principles look like. Yeah, look, it's, um, it's a really big initiative at the National Gallery and I have to credit our director, Nick Mitsevich, and um, also assistant director, Natasha Bullock. You know, I think people often assume that as curators, we have free reign, but you really do need that overarching support for what we are, we are trying to do. And I think that in terms of the gender equity um, program, we have um, a gender equity working group. I mean, it is about conversations, but it's also about actions. How can we make this real? So we're looking at um, how we get more parity in terms of acquisitions. I think we're looking at the overall program. You know, it's an amazing program here at the gallery that goes beyond the exhibition. So we've just had a really big conference um, opening up many ideas and I'm sure Anne Temkin will identify you have to develop a thick skin, you know, people are, can be quite critical of institutions and when you're trying to implement change, that's part of it, you know, it's, it's part of the story, it's part of looking critically at ourselves, but also having the support to really um, make change. So it's, it's not just acquisitions, it's exhibition displays, it's programs outside the gallery. And it's been very exciting with this particular initiative that we've actually had a program of, of billboards around the country. Um, my colleague, Jesse England, has been working on this so that in every state in Australia, there are billboards with huge images of um, of women by women around the country so you know it's as as we all know, it's also about trying to shift the thinking and that's that's the bigger aim. Uh and Tim can tell me, does this sound familiar? Do uh, these principles similar to the ones that you've been using? Obviously, MoMA is, a, as I said, an incredible institution, kind of a world leader. People look 
to it to see what it's doing so it can they can copy and i wonder if uh if you could tell me a little bit about how those principles echo the ones that you that you used yeah the same exactly the same i mean i think what it points to um Deborah, I'm sure you agree, is that it is an amazing time to be a curator right now. Totally, yeah. Totally. Because there is just this wave that has swept the entire world. We're a good um, example of that, of that in a sense, you know, to borrow the phrase, time's up, right? Time's up for what we accepted for many decades or for what had little blips of, of um, resistance or revision um, at different points. And now I feel that the turning point is, um, you know, irreversible. And everybody's at work on it, not because they're copying each other or not because someone had the idea and others are following, but it's such a kind of spontaneous um, awakening that being aware isn't enough. Doing exactly. is what's yeah. essential. So following on from that, if you wouldn't mind, Anne Temkin still, um, tell me about the female curator. What, what is, is that just about being a champion of women or does the, does the female curator have a different eye? Does she have a different sensibility? Uh, is, there a different, is there a different language? What is, do women bring something to curation that is as different other than the fact that they're more sensitive to women? It's guess what I'm asking. Well, one thing that I would say um, is just before I really answer directly, it's been um, a female field all along curating um, because in many cases it's poorly paid, right? <laughs> so like teaching, uh, like librarians, it's been a field at least in the US that is been remarkably majority women and yet, as in many other industries, you know, then magically, when it comes to the top position, the chief curator or the director, from out of seemingly nowhere, all these men appear and get those positions. So it's only been, I would say, fairly in the last 10 and at most 20 years that there are women curators in the positions to make certain um, global isn't quite the right word, but changes of the impact that only somebody at the top of the administrative system could make. But it's not as if there haven't been women curators all along. And one of the particular sadnesses, and again, this extends to other fields, is that all of those years, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when women were curators, they in fact didn't feel sufficiently empowered or sufficiently courageous to um, look at how brainwashed they were almost. And I include myself in this because I was a curator in the 80s and 90s to say, wait a minute, I've had it. This is crazy. We went along with what we were taught and how we learned art history, which was an art history written by white men. Totally. And I think all of the bad things that have happened over the last decade in particular finally just sort of broke that spell, if, if that's not too strong a way of putting it. And then to answer your question, um, <laughs> actually, I, I don't think there's a different way of seeing necessarily, but there's definitely a different way of working. There is a collaborative way of working. I don't know if that's biological or what we've been socially conditioned to do out of necessity. We collaborate. So, you know, um, one, as you mentioned, one of the essential points about the Museum of Modern Art's rehang is an intermixing of drawings, prints, photography, video, film, architecture, design, with painting and sculpture. Until now, these were all separated and painting and sculpture occupied the vast majority of the gallery real estate in the building. So coincidence or not, that it's a woman who becomes the chief curator of painting and sculpture, who in a way puts aside the real estate advantage that painting and sculpture has enjoyed for decades and says that is secondary to the artistic and intellectual goals that we have right now. Really interesting. Yeah, I think, uh, can I jump in just briefly? Well, I, I was gonna I ask so, you to. 
<laughs> yeah, I just so identify with everything I'm saying. It's like, it is incredible. It's like this zeitgeist, you know, and I'm sure we'll, you know, with Anne Summers, you know, you had this in, in the 70s, but it's like there are these moments in time and it's, it's just like exactly what you're saying, you know, working collaboratively. This exhibition, I should acknowledge, is co-curated with Elspeth Fitch, but we've worked with other curators in the building. Like, really, it's not about one person. It, it is about a collective and very much echoing also what, what Anne Temkin is saying about media, you know, breaking down those hierarchies is, is very much a part of all of this, you know, to, to look at um, media across the board, to look at women of different backgrounds, to include diverse stories, to not tell those same old patriarchal stories about this, the history of art. And when you start mixing it up, and, you know, I love what you've done and Hemken at, at MoMA with, um, you know, mixing up art from different countries, you know, I think we just start to get a much richer, um, more complex and nuanced story to what art is about. I want to skip over to you, Anne, uh, other Anne, for a sec, and I'd say, does this sound familiar to you in the way that other um, disciplines have uh, women have emerged in those I mean I think of architecture I think of comedy and it feels like a lot of the same discussions have been had that you know you have the the, the first sort of vanguard of women who don't feel empowered in the boardroom or wherever to really speak up and then eventually there becomes this tipping point and I wonder I guess I have two questions here one where does art fall in the kind of feminist uh, uh, revolution is it is it a forerunner or is it more of like a caboose is it like at the back and also are, are these patterns patterns that you recognize from elsewhere where women have finally you know found their footing in in a uh, and found that sort of respect and recognition in a field women uh, not only involved pushing for the uh, the rights if you like of women artists but they also helped uh, develop the uh, the iconography of the movement. I mean, there, we had posters, we had badges, we had banners, we had things that needed to be created and designed. We also had ways of expressing, uh, if you like, our oppression and, and artists that took on, on that job. And I mean, in the 70s in Australia, there were art magazines, uh, Lip was one, uh, there were others um, created by young feminist artists of the time. There was also, you know, a lot of video, a lot of movies, a lot of uh, other media. Um, don't forget the tin sheds at Sydney University, which was a, a, a wonderful place where political posters were created and where women uh, played a very big role. So I think women have been at the forefront of um, the movement for women's equality within art. Uh, what's changed, and it's interesting hearing these two curators, curators talk, what's changed is the institutions have become more responsive. I mean, if you think back to um, the Gorilla Girls, for example, um, and I just want me to hold up their posters just to remind everybody, one of their iconic posters, uh, the advantages <laughs> of uh, being a woman artist, and these are all to do with money, not being distracted by wealth and fame and all the things that uh, are so annoying for male artists who are successful. Uh, but I mean, they started uh, from the mid-1980s trying to push for both um, racial and, and gender equality within art institutions, and they did things like uh, as well as keeping uh, records of the, the commercial galleries in New York and how they were going with their uh, women's artists, uh, uh, women's representation, which is pretty bad. Uh, they also did some memorable um, agitprop. You know, one of the, my favourite um, posters was, you know, it said, uh, what, you have, do you have to be naked to get into the Met? And they made the point that of less than, fewer than 5% of the uh, contemporary artists on display at the Met were female, but 95% of the uh, nudes on display at the net were, were male. So you've had this kind of agitation all along and what's happening now, and it's so welcome, and I hope Anne Tempton's right in that it is uh, a tipping point and one where it's going to stick, you know, it's not going to be a blip, it's going to be rather a, a, a time's up moment and we are reframing uh, the way in which stories are told and it's going to be uh, forever. Uh, because it's certainly been a long time coming. But women artists have been there all the time pushing for it, uh, just having a hard time often getting heard and even a harder time getting hung. 
So um, you mentioned, Anne Temkin, that it was an interesting time to be a curator, I think, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that and to both of you who work in art institutions. It's, there's, been, there's been quite a lot of um, art news breaking up into the regular news this year with the, uh, say, I'm going to say this guy's name wrong, but the Guston uh, exhibition. Justin. Gustin. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, I could have looked that up. The Gustin exhibition uh, being cancelled uh, because of some imagery that it was felt would be misunderstood. And then um, the Baltimore Museum, which was going to sell three works by, you know, canonical works, but to start an endowment to so that people who were less likely to visit galleries could come for free, you know, the more underrepresented visitors could come for free, that they could buy new works by underrepresented artists and that they could pay their staff who are often female or people of color a fairer wage. And of course, uh, this was not allowed, this was canceled, I believe like the day before the- No, the uh, hour before the auction. The, <laughs> Right, right on the auction, uh, you know, right as the hammer came down, we could almost say if we were, you know, the Daily Mail. So, um, and I wondered, you know, obviously there's very uh, contested, uh, very contested time in our culture as to what is important, what, ex what institutions should be doing, who they should be serving, who we should be looking at. And is this does this make it a good time to try and rebalance um, women artists? As you said, women are not a minority and they're especially not a minority of people who visit galleries. So does this make it more difficult or does the uproar make it easier because we're just rethinking everything? I'd like to start perhaps with you, um, Anne. Yeah, I don't think there's anything controversial about this. So that's great, let all that noise happen. Um, on these other issues, but truly, um, except for some maybe grumpy men who we're not particularly hearing from, um, I think this is a pretty uncontroversial thing to be doing at this particular moment. And certainly all, all we've heard is more, more. You, I believe, are on the committee that sort of sets these protocols. Would MoMA ever sell a major canonical work to buy work by female artists? Oh, we, we've been doing that regularly. We don't um, make a fuss about it, but we regularly deaccession work. We do not um, deaccession work that is not redundant within the collection. So the way we choose to make deaccessions is only in the cases of a work, say we have seven paintings by so-and-so and we figure, we, we don't figure out, we work for endless hours to come to the decision that painting seven out of the seven is less important than the other six and of less quality, but that it would still have financial value to some degree. Um, so we, we deaccession at a very lively rate um, my department personally, anywhere, well, over the last 10 years, I could tell you, we've sold 150 works. And much of that has gone to purchasing under addressed areas. I think we've been doing it under the radar, which is how I prefer. But um, absolutely, that that is since we were founded, and I think this is obviously very, very different thing than government um, museums where for the most part, I think there's no deaccessioning allowed. Is that true in Canberra? Um, no, actually we, uh, we do deaccession works. It is a little bit more complicated in some ways being a younger institution. And as you yes. say, also yes. a government funded institution, but um, yeah, no, we, we definitely um, do have a deaccessioning um, policy and uh, constantly revisiting, yeah, yeah, how we're collecting. But what Did I'm proud to say, I guess, about MoMA is, is we haven't had to go into um, what I would perceive as controversial territory 
with this policy. And that is, of course, because we are fortunate enough to have such deep holdings that when we're looking to deaccession, we can stick to that fairly conservative um, way of working and still come up with the funds that produce the money to, um, for example, acquire um, our first work by Leonora Carrington, our first work by Remedios Barro, our first work by Tarsila do Amaral, um, just to name a few in the last couple of years. Would you care to share who you sold to buy those? Oh, um, a painting by Leger that we were given, that we were bequeathed um, a few years back by a wonderful trustee of ours. And it so happened to be from the same series as a Leger that was in the collection. And so we spoke with her children and um, this happened to be a beautiful match because it was an absolutely magnificent um, lady who, who had left us this. And we felt very confident that it would please her um, to use the money in this way. And marvelously, you know, her, her heirs agreed. But that, but that money, um, you know, made all the difference because these, these are not, um, even though MoMA hadn't seen fit to buy a painting by Remedios Varro, for example, on the market, that is an expensive painting today. And it goes the same for the others. Okay, so I guess I have to ask this question. It's kind of a journalist's, not an, a curator's question, but I, the feminist movement is 50 years old now. And as someone who was born into it, I thought we would have made more progress in the art world since the days that I thought that Joan Moreau was a woman. And I, I'd love anyone to address, any one of us three, to you three, I guess, to address what um, they see generally um, as holding women artists back. Um, is it the way women are socialized to be collaborators and not people who are individuals? Is it a, still a, a money thing? Is it motherhood? Is it a lack of models? Um, you know, is there something that female artists could be doing differently to be more successful? And I understand that both of you you know, have collected female artists and consider female many female artists to be successful and canon worthy. But I would also point out that there are still very many people who are in the position I was 30 years ago, who when asked probably could not name a, a contemporary female artist. And I wonder if it's, what has to change next? Where, where, where should we be making inroads? Maybe I'll start well, with, I, with you, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess that's, you know, really the whole point of the exhibition, you know, and the idea of Know My Name. I mean, even the title itself was like something in the air because it was about um, our director saying, well, how many people would know those women's names? But I do think there are cycles, you know, Anne was talking, um, Anne Summers was talking about um, the 70s. And as we all know, you know, I mean, our exhibition starts at 1900, even though it's not a linear trajectory. But, you know, there, there were women working in, in the early part of the last century who were doing amazing work. You know, I don't think it's what women weren't doing. It's really like, as, as um, Anne Summers was saying, and, and Anne Temkin, it's about how their work was seen, how it was collected, you know. So we have, for example, a fantastic work by the artist Vida Lay, which was really referencing, you know, that old, ex that experience that women had in the back rooms of houses doing the laundry. And, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant painting, really the equal of, of her male peers at that time. But her mother had been an activist um, at the turn of the, the previous century, you know, and, and was really wanting the work of women that was out of sight and out of mind to be seen. And so I think what happens is you get these waves, you know, from um, the early 20th century, you then get it again in the 20s and 30s, you know, later on with the 70s and, and summers, I'm so excited to tell you, we, we do have a great big wall of posters um, by women. And I have to say, it's not entirely uncontroversial. I had a journalist in yesterday who said, 
oh, but you know, is it really art? And I just wanted to like, you know, tear my hair out because it is about that collective expression and they're really powerful posters and they are works of art and it is about a social context. And as Tem and Temkin was saying, it is about that collective and collaborative way of working that is so common in women's practice. So, you know, I hope I'm, I'm answering your question, but I think, um, I think it really is something that we need to keep doing. And I, I agree that we are at a really um, exciting moment in time. I mean, this is like a dream come true for me. And um, I also felt this kind of liberating sense that I was able with my co-curator, Elspeth Pitt and other people in this building to have such a big footprint. I mean, we've never had like eight galleries, huge galleries to work with dedicated solely to women. And just to finish on, on that point, from my perspective, you know, some people have said, why do we need so much space just for women? And I said, well, how much space has been given to just men or to a token representation of women for so many years? You know, time is up. Can no, I, uh, do, Anne, please. Um, I mean, one point that I think we can't uh, not address, and that is the, um, difficulties faced by women uh, who are artists and mothers. And this is certainly Constance Stokes' is a big, one of her big issues that she called herself very famously part mother, part artist. And she had described how she was working one day at her easel and she was totally engrossed in the, the work she was making. And she felt this sort of tug at her, at her skirt and it was her little daughter, her little three-year-old daughter wanting attention. And she just wanted to hit the child and get her away because she was, she was forced to choose between the needs of her child and the, the needs of her art. And this was something that, I mean, she stopped painting for about 10 years because of her children. And she always said it was having children that was one of the uh, things that stopped her doing as well as she thought she could have done. And if you look at the women artists in Australia, um, I can't speak for the United States so much, but in Australia, the well-known women artists of the, say the 20th century, very few of them have been mothers. Um, and those who were um, have expressed the kind of frustration that Constance Stokes experienced and the kind of just the actual physical difficulties that artists have that say writers don't have. And there are a lot more women writers with children than, than there are women artists with children. And Mira Merker is a great example. She describes you know, painting with her baby under her arm and she gets paint on the baby's leg and then she feels so guilty that the, the paint's going to hurt the, the little baby's skin. And so many women have made the choice to, to put their energies into their work and not into their, their, their having children. And that's a choice that of course, the male artist does not have to make. And that's a choice that women in so many fields um, have to make still. And that's a great area that still has not been of, of contradiction, that still hasn't been resolved. And uh, it's gonna take us a while, I think, before we figure it out, but we shouldn't not talk about it. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Just to, to also say, though, I think one of the great gains that has been made in recent years, you know, thanks a lot in, t in terms of the work that you were doing is childcare, for example, has, has made a big difference. And, you know, I think one of the, the other things that should be acknowledged and is actually part of one of the projects um, that's happening at the gallery is the changing role of, of um, many men as parents taking more responsibility. That's not to undercut anything you were saying because I totally agree that that's been the story through the 20th century for many, many women. And you're right, many of them um, chose not to be mothers and it was very much more difficult for women who um, were mothers. But I, I, I do hope that that landscape is, is able to change a bit. And I think for some women it has been, hopefully. From your mouth, well, I, can, you. no, I, I don't think it's happening in America. Optimistic <laughs> note with a pessimistic note, um, this morning's headline on page one of the New York Times was quite terrifying. I don't know how many of you read it, but just a very deep analysis of how the pandemic um, has taken a completely horrible toll on work, working women for exactly this reason, that within the couple, it's she who ends up having to leave her job um, with the kids at home, with schools closed in the United States. And the numbers they show and the anecdotes they give, you know, aren't saying that this is a one or two year problem. This is actually now a problem perhaps for this entire generation. 
because those women are off the career track, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think even more difficult, I mean, completely right. I think it's something like four times as many women have left work during the pandemic than uh, than men. I think even more difficult when you're an artist and you're a young artist and you're starting out and, and you're not bringing in any money. The men at least can say, well, I have to go out and, you know, yeah. You know, and and the, I'm a I'm a working writer, so I can say I'm earning money, and therefore I'm justified to do this. But if I were just sitting alone in a gallery, um, painting, uh, sorry, in a in an, a studio painting, it's very hard to to sort of just. You have to have a lot more self confidence, I think, to justify that. Yeah. Um, so Deborah, internationally, um, it, it, now that you know we're talking about mothers and 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 mm -hmm. painting and and. Uh, who can make a living on it? The the best uh, known Australian female artists are Indigenous artists, and I wondered if how that was reflected in the in the Know My Name uh, exhibition and campaign. Yeah, I think that's um, a really important part of our exhibition. So, um, starting out on the portrait wall, we have a fantastic portrait of um, a woman elder from this community, Dr. Matilda House, and she's a custodian of country. You know, and and this is running this this project is running parallel with really trying to redress some of the issues about colonialism in this country, and being able to start the woman with a power with the the exhibition with an image of a powerful women by Dr. Brenda L. Croft um, was really important. And as you come into the first room of the gallery, we have a fantastic new commission um, by a collective called the Jampy Desert Weavers. And it's referring to the Seven Sisters story. And there are these wonderful kind of life-size figures all woven out of the Jampy grasses. And it was really, you know, talking about the pandemic, we had hoped to get many artists here to install their works with us. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't possible um, for the women to travel from their, their part of the country. But we did have a great Zoom session. And, you know, this is an amazing work. It's like got this cosmos represented in a woven sky that's interwoven with little lights and these sisters standing underneath it. And they were there on Zoom directing us, a, you know, a little bit higher for the canopy and just move the women this, this way. And so that was very exciting. And my colleague, Kelly Cole, a curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art was with us um, and very much involved in that commission. But really there's a lot of different work by indigenous women um, in the exhibition. And we hope to show that diversity. You know, we've got fantastic work by Judy Watson relating to the environment and, and to the sense of light and an all encompassing space. We have um, work by artists like Sally Gabori. And I think for American artists, sometimes seeing the work of people like Emily Kamenwari, who's probably one of our best known artists, and Sally Gabori, you know, it looks like fantastic abstract painting, but actually it's very much informed by a lifetime of, of engagement with place. And the works are so ambitious and on such a considerable scale that it takes your breath away. I mean, Sally Gabori painted one of the biggest works in the show when she was 81, you know, so it's, um, it's quite incredible. And we also wanted to open up a conversation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous women artists, um, a conversation in terms of what their works are doing and saying. Can you at all elaborate for those who are not familiar with the Indigenous art market, why the women have been so much more successful in that market than they have, um, you know, in kind of the non-Indigenous market? Is there something about that community that values their work more? Um, That's a question for you, you, Deborah. Oh, sure. Um, look, I think, I think it's a complex thing. You know, I, I feel like um, Indigenous art um, captured the imagination of, of many people. I've seen such a change in the last 20 to 30 years of just the diversity of expression. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's that capturing of the imagination, this profound connection with country. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago um, were pigeonholing um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art as, as works that were relatively small scale, always on bark um, of, of, of a particular style. But in fact, um, there, you know, that is really important. And one of the works um, in the exhibition is a massive bark by a woman called 
Noongan Amara Willie. And I remember walking into a gallery and seeing her work. And I just, you know, I'm sure we've all had this, where you just go weak at the knees and you think, oh my God, you know, that is really exceptional. So I guess it's that kind of feeling that has informed a lot of, a lot of people. Um, so Anne, one of the fam most famous works of art by a woman, I guess, is Judy Chicago's piece at the Sackler Gallery, um, The Dinner Party. And that's a gallery that's dedicated to feminist art. And I wonder, is are we moving to a point where like a feminist art gallery is not necessary because we don't have to have these woman only spaces because we can have parity in the regular gallery or is there still a place for something like the the Sackler where it's just all a, a woman only space this is um Anne Summers I was going to ask this question oh, okay. <laughs> um I mean, I would, I would imagine and, and like to think that there is um, space for both and there needs to be space for both. Um, I mean, I've um, recently, well, before the pandemic, obviously, visited the Brooklyn Museum and, and saw uh, the dinner party project and I'd never seen it before and, all, and I didn't see it uh, when and it was first exhibited in 1979, even though it toured Australia in the 80s, I didn't see it. So it was, it was quite something to see it uh, in New York uh, at, at the uh, Special Sackler Gallery a couple of years ago. And it's, it's such an extraordinary piece and it would take a fairly extraordinary institution to agree to house it and perhaps uh, need the prodding of the kind of request that, <laughs> that obviously uh, uh, the Sackler, Elizabeth Sackler provided in order to make it happen. And I think there will always be um, and there ought, ought to be a space for specialist galleries of all kinds, not just for feminists, uh, but for all kinds of uh, endeavours. But at the same time, I mean, we need to be integrated into the overall story of, of our country and, and our globe and our, uh, our, our effort. And so I think we belong in both places. Is it, do you agree with that? Um, and T, is that something that uh, would Mama ever do a women only kind of feminist art wing well actually um just to go into it a little more um granularly the there is a movement or an ism um kind of however you want to describe it from this very moment that Anne was part of 50 years ago of feminist art right so that that itself is now a movement just like pop art is or minimalist art is and those artists, whether it's in a gallery alone or, you know, a certain area of um, a museum, that's a thing. That's a coherent international phenomenon from the 70s that deserves its place. That's a distinction from art by anyone who, who is a woman. Do you know what I'm saying? So for me, that always um, will be needing and wanting to be represented as an ism just like minimalism um but then that goes alongside of course all the women who made art before that after that um who weren't particularly looking at a feminist an explicitly feminist iconography or style but who are women Deborah, you spoke of going weak at the knees when you saw a particular mm -hmm. artist um i wonder when you were putting together the Know My Name exhibition, and also I'd love Anne uh, T to answer this about her rehang. Was there somebody in your collection or somebody you discovered that you were like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that you got really excited about? And I guess I'm asking this partly because people can go look that person and also because then, you know, investors who are watching this can know who to collect in the future yeah. because, you know, you guys are so excited about them. Oh, it's really hard to single out um, one, but maybe just to, to mention um, a couple of things. So there was a woman, um, Margaret Worth, uh, who was very active in the 60s. She um, had that very issue that and Summers was talking about with 
children and her role as a woman. And it was very difficult for her to get recognized. Margaret Worth's name is not well known in Australia. Um, she was for a time married to a much more famous artist, um, or used to be, we hope that it will, the, the scales would balance up. But um, Sid Ball, and you know, there was a big exhibition here um, called The Field, and it was an exciting exhibition, but the representation of women wasn't great. And they selected her husband and she, when the curator came to visit um, the house, they looked at his work, not her work. And um, she was, she said to me, you know, oh, I was really hoping they would come and have a look at my work, but I had to serve the dinner. And um, so Margaret's work that we've recently acquired for the gallery um, is an abstract work. It's incredibly dynamic. You know, we're talking about a woman who actually went and studied in America. She worked with Sol Lewitt, with Richard Serra. Um, she really knew what she was doing. And she came back and she just, you know, it's this incredible tenacity of so many women to just keep going behind the scenes. And the work that we acquired was a swap with another artist. Um, um, and the other artists said, oh, when they heard that we were doing this exhibition, Nigel Landon said, oh, it should really come to your collection. And when we went to see Margaret um, and her daughter was there, I mean, she was really overwhelmed. And her daughter said, oh, my God, at last somebody will know my mother's name. And, you know, it was a really poignant moment. And her work is, we, we've been very lucky with our spaces. The spaces are quite large and we've used the height and her work is, is really flying high. And um, I hope that with her work and other artists like Marie Haggerty, um, who's not so well known, that she's also flying pretty high on the wall, um, albeit that they're both paintings, but um, you know, both incredible works. And I just hope that people will come and really discover their art. Do you have a story like that, um, Anne T, about your rehang or somebody that you came across in the in the bowels of MoMA? I like to think of all those paintings stacked up against each other and you're flipping through them like we used to flip through LP records and you're like, oh my goodness, there it is. But I'm, I'm not sure. About that. Well, it's actually a very beautiful warehouse in Queens, I have to say, um, our bowels. But <laughs> sure, of course. And I think one of the... Um, you know, truisms for us is like, who's your favorite? Well, what was yesterday, right? So the, the picture that we put up, maybe not yesterday, but literally last week, as we were redoing um, a gallery built around um, Pete Mondrian was a painting, and we have two, of Marlo Moss. Do any of you know Marlo Moss's name? She was born Marjorie Moss. Um, she was British, went and became part of the um, extraction creation circle in Paris around 1930. Very, very um, good friends with Mondrian Arp, you know, that whole um, pioneering group. Um, you have to look her up to see photos of her. Just absolutely um, amazing self-presentation. And the picture that we put up is a very radical all white picture, all white painting that includes rope on, on the surface of the rail on canvas. And I think the thrill of it is that literally, you know, I had never heard of her studying art or in all of those years since then as well. And here she is, you know, under our nose. Those sort of discoveries are ongoing. Marlo Moss, you heard it here first, folks. Okay, so um, I want to ask one fun, well, I'll see how we've got for time, but my penultimate question, maybe ultimate question, is that journalists are always told to follow the money, right? So I would love to know who each of you, and this includes you, Anne Summers, um, would think will be the first artist to break into that stratosphere. When you look up you know, who who's selling really well at auction. It tends to be this rotating Hockney, Richter, Warhol, Hockney, Richter, Warhol kind of cycle with the coons, sorry, thrown in there. A lot of coons thrown in there. And I wonder who do you think um, will be, let's choose a living, a, a female uh, artist who's alive, who may have the best shot at getting to be up there in the sort of Sotheby's Christie's kind of exciting numbers. Do you, anybody have a, 
a candidate they'd like to nominate? Um, we probably should start with the most expert or the most close to Sotheby's. So that would be you and T. Who do you think will be a 20 blocks person? away? <laughs> 20 <laughs> blocks away and only three blocks away from Christie's. Um, but, you know, one who comes to mind who, who is no longer alive, um, but until recently was, is Louise Bourgeois. So those prices are already um, at a level that acknowledges her, um, you know, in, in that exorbitant um, price tag for a work of art level um, and completely well deserved, absolutely as it should be. Do you have uh, somebody, uh, Deborah, that you think will be recognized by the, I guess what I'm asking really is who is commerce gonna recognize? Who is the kind of art collecting world gonna recognize, do you think? Well, you know, I think you've really hit on quite a problem that is, you know, we talk about gender parity and the prices for women's art is generally not anywhere near um, as much as, as men's art. I mean, I would agree with Anne Temkin, obviously, Louise Bourgeois, somebody that we all love here as curators. Um, you know, it's great to see her work being recognised um, in that way. Um, Yayoi Kusama, I mean, I, I'm not familiar exactly how much her work is going for, for now but you know it's it's like one of those crazy tragedies you know that artists um, had to struggle so hard you know in the most fundamental ways when they're being really ex experimental like Kusama was and now it's it's just um, it's changed you know why did it have to take so long you know in this country I guess you know, is it even getting close to the prices of, of the male artists? I'm not sure, but somebody like Patricia Piccinini um, is now getting the recognition that some of her male peers are on the market. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I guess it's it's a tricky ongoing thing that um, I think women still, we still have a long way to go before women are being recognized in the same way in terms of the commercial market. And Summers, do you want to weigh in or can I? Well, I'll, I'll come at it somewhat differently and say, um, you know, while we're all very obsessed, particularly in the current uh, period with the art market and the contribution of hedge fund billionaires and various others of that small elite who can afford to pay these many millions of dollars for uh, a very small number of arts of work, uh, just how ephemeral this really is in determining an artist's value. Um, I just point to the example of Constance Stokes, who uh, back in the 1950s was selling works for 10 times uh, the price uh, that many of her male colleagues were getting. Uh, and I would point particularly to uh, um, Russell Drysdale, who of course was, you know, and, and so iconic in Australia that everybody knows his name. Um, he lives on, his painting sell for many, many millions now. She's completely forgotten. So um, to measure it at any one point of time and say, well, this person's doing very, very well uh, is not necessarily a measure of what um, the future holds for them in terms of their longevity, uh, in terms of being recognised. Nor indeed of their, nor indeed of their value to the culture or of their talent. Well, that seems like bringing Constance back and that reminder back seems like a great place to wrap this up. And we are indeed out of time. I just want to thank you three, all you three doctors from the non-doctor in the room for uh, contributing to this conversation. I think it's been fascinating. And I wish you all the best with uh, your continued uh, fight on this front. And I really look forward to seeing um, the, the National Gallery's show and, uh, and the sort of uh, the impact that it makes on uh, the Australian environment. Thanks very much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. An illuminating discussion, I'm sure you'll all agree. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists in New York and Canberra, Dr. Deborah Hart, Dr. Anne Temkin, and Dr. Anne Summers. And thank you, Belinda Luscombe, for your excellent moderating. The American Friends of the National Gallery of Australia will be back next year with more art talks. In the meantime, you can visit us at our website where you can also make a tax deductible donation to support our efforts here in the United States to make sure more Americans know about Australia's leading gallery and its remarkable collection. Stay well, all the best for the holiday season, and we really look forward to seeing you in the new year.